Hello, and welcome to the National Book Awards Teen Press Conference. My name is Ruth Dickey, and I am the Executive Director of the National Book Foundation. At the National Book Foundation, we work to connect people with books. We do that through events like this, where young people can hear directly from these amazing authors of young people's literature, through programs in schools and after school, through our public programs at book festivals and on college campuses, and of course, through the National Book Awards. One week from today, on November 17th, we'll be giving out awards in a few categories in order to celebrate the best literature in the United States. This year's National Book Awards will be broadcast live online, and everyone is invited. I hope that you'll be able to tune in. The awards are a big, exciting annual event, and not just for writers or publishers or those in the publishing world, but also for readers. The awards let readers learn about, discover, and celebrate books and the achievements of fantastic writers. We are joined by five fantastic writers, the 2021 finalists for the National Book Award for Young People's Literature. Every year, the National Book Foundation assembles a team of celebrated authors, experts, publishers, and booksellers to serve as judges for each award category. This year's judges for Young People's Literature read 344 books. They narrowed those 344 down to 10 books on the long list and from 10 to five finalists. Those five finalist authors join us today for Teen Press Conference. In advance of today's event, you and your teachers received a reporter's notebook featuring background information on each of the featured books and authors, as well as an answer to a question posed by to each of the finalists. Today, we'll hear more from those authors in response to questions that you've submitted. We want to thank you for submitting such excellent questions for these authors. We hope to have as many answered as we can in the next hour. A few additional thank yous. First, to partners who have helped spread the word and register classrooms for today's event at the Miami Book Fair and at New York City's 92nd Street Y. Thank you to publishers for providing books in conjunction with this event. Penguin Random House, Candlewick Press, and Macmillan. Thank you to our teaching artist, Leah Lakins, for helping secure student questions. And to my colleague, Andy Donnelly, who fabulously manages educational programs at the National Book Foundation. And finally, thanks to teachers for organizing everything and getting students signed on to participate in today's event. We are thrilled that you can join us. And now I'm honored to introduce the host for this morning's event, although it is early afternoon where he is in London, poet, educator, publisher, and award-winning author, Kwame Alexander. Kwame has written 35 books that you know well, Swing, Becoming Muhammad Ali, Booked, Rebound, and The Undefeated. He has been longlisted for the National Book Awards and has won a number of awards for his writing, the Caldecott Medal, the Newbery Medal, and the Coretta Scott King Author Honor. He started his own publishing imprint, Versify, has co-founded an international literacy program, and opened the Barbara E. Alexander Memorial Library and Health Clinic in Ghana. And he has big news about a TV adaptation of his work. His book, The Crossover, will be a series this year on Disney+. Plus. Kwame has adopted two of his beloved children's books, Acoustic Rooster and Indigo Bloom, for the stage, and they'll be performing live at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., starting next week through the end of the month. We're thrilled that Kwame is streaming in from across the ocean to help us celebrate this year's finalists. With that, here's Kwame Alexander. Thank you so much. What's happening, teachers? and students and readers and writers and parents and everybody. They wanted me to make opening remarks. I got five minutes, so let's make this quick. Let's get to it. I'm gonna tell you three things about myself. Number one, I'm probably talking too loud. Number one, I loved books growing up until I didn't. And I didn't at age 11 when my dad started making me read his dissertations. My dad was a book publisher. And every year we went to New York City to sell books at a book fair that he sponsored on Thanksgiving day. What in the world? 
We went to, we lived in Virginia. We drove up to New York. We had Thanksgiving dinner at a place called Hunan Park restaurant. That's right. We ate Chinese food for Thanksgiving. That's a whole nother conversation. This one particular Thanksgiving day, we're driving up. We're on the New Jersey Turnpike. Me, my sisters, my mom, and my dad, and a trunk full of books. Because of course, we're gonna be selling books at my dad's book fair. Well, unfortunately, my dad fell asleep at the wheel of the car on the New Jersey Turnpike. And the car crashed. And it turned, it's, it has a happy ending, people. The car turned over. It flipped over like 11 times. We were upside down when it stopped. My mom was crying, my sisters were crying. I was just stunned. I looked out, I got out the car and looked out behind us and all of our books were strewed out over the highway. There were trucks and cars that had stopped behind us. Nobody hit us, thankfully. First words out of my dad's mouth go get the books. What? Are you kidding me? After a major accident on the New Jersey Turnpike, all he could think about was the books. This is how I grew up. The book that made me sort of fall back in love with books was a book called The Greatest, the autobiography of Muhammad Ali, 430 some pages, published by Random House. Muhammad Ali's editor was a woman by the name of, wait for it, Toni Morrison. It was published in 1978. I couldn't put the book down. I read it. And that's when I realized, I couldn't articulate it then, but books are amusement parks. And sometimes you gotta let kids choose to ride. Story number three, fast forward a whole bunch of years later. I end up getting a call from a guy you may have heard of. His name is James Patterson. He's the world's best-selling author. He calls me on a Wednesday in December of 2018. He says, Kwame, we should write a book together. And I'm like, is this a prank call? What? I say, yeah, okay. He says, it's going to be a book about Muhammad Ali. We're going to talk about his childhood when he was Cassius Clay. So I say, sure. We start writing the book. I write a chapter send it to him, he writes a chapter, sends it back to me. I write a chapter, he writes a chapter. We get to chapter five, he sends it to me, and I have some issues with it. So I send him an email. I say, Jim, because that's what I call him. Got a little bit of an issue with chapter five. I think I need you to fix this and fix that. And my dad's like, how are you gonna tell the world's best-selling author what to fix? Are you crazy? But it needed fixing. So I get an email back from James Patterson. It says, Dear Kwame, thank you so much for your email. I would never begin to tell you what to do with your poetry. Love, Jim. <laughs> right? I guess he was telling me, dude, I'm the world's best-selling author. But then guess what? Teachers, students, he made the changes. Because at the end of the day, it's not about our egos. It's about the words. It's about the books, the words, the literature, the language, that's what matter. And we're here today to celebrate the words and the books. I am thrilled, I am beyond thrilled to introduce each of you to the 2021 finalists for the National Book Award for Young People's Literature. Each finalist is gonna read a brief, a very brief excerpt from their work. And then we're gonna have a little bit of time for questions. So let's get into it. First up, we have Xing Yin Kor for their book, The Legend of Auntie Po. Now, Xing Yin is a cartoonist, an illustration artist who explores the Americana mythos and new human rituals. They are a Malaysian Chinese immigrant and a US citizen since 2011. Their previous graphic novel, the American dream, the American dream, because it has a question mark on it, you see, was about traveling. Well, I'm not gonna tell you what highway it is. I'll try to let you figure it out. It used to be called the Will Rogers Highway or Main Street of America or the Mother Road. That's right, it's one of the original highways in the US highway system. 
Route 66. National Book Award finalist, Shane Yin Kaur, take it away. I'm, I'm Shing Yin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shing Yin Kaur. Uh, I also eat Chinese food at Thanksgiving. And um, I'm going to read from my book, The Legend of Auntie Po. Logging a forest is like a dance. The loggers slide past each other, and sharp blades and soft humans and heavy logs jostle for space. Polly's a bore, but he's good as a job. Do you ever wish you could work out there with them? Mm, it's very dangerous. Mm hmm. B, are you listening to me? Mm, yeah. What are you even looking at? Oh, who? Who are you looking at? The new boy. He just came down from Wisconsin and he's from a logging family just like me. Dad says that he's a natural leader. He's young, but the men trust him. Dad says he'll be a foreman in two or three years. If he doesn't die first, nay. You said it's a dangerous job. What's gotten into you? I'm going for a walk. I need to get kindling for the stoves. I can go with you. No, thanks. Why do I feel so bad? B is just confiding in me about normal girl things. I should like that. I don't like it. Ugh. Ugh. <gasps> Hi. I hear you've been telling stories about me. Yes, but I made you up. You're just a story. Wait. I can make things real with my brain. Be careful, Ami. It will be difficult. Um, okay, you didn't answer my question. Wait, what do I need to be careful of? Wait, I have questions. Uh, even the gods I invent aren't that useful. I wish B could see this. The Thank you, and thank you. Well, thank you, Xing Yen. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Melinda Lowe for her book, Last Night at the Telegraph Club. Melinda is the author of several acclaimed novels, including Ash, a lesbian retelling of Cinderella, and A Lion in the Dark, which Kirkus and Vulture named Best Young Adult Book of the Year. She's also a writer of nonfiction with essays published by the New York Times, Book Review, and NPR. She lives with her wife in the place where volleyball was first played and where it's illegal to make clam chowder with tomatoes. The great state of Massachusetts, National Book Award finalist, Melinda Lowe. Hello, everyone. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I will be reading from last night at the Telegraph Club. So in this scene, the main character, Lily, is taking her friend Kath to look at a book. Lily spun the rack of tawdry paperbacks again, then began to flip through novel after novel, hunting for the provocative cover of Strange Season. The blonde, that had to be Patrice, in her negligee on the floor, the brunette Maxine with dark eyes, above in her sultry black gown. Lily was aware of Kath beside her, watching, and she said, it's been here for weeks. I thought it would still be here. What, um, what was it about, Kath asked. When she decided to show the book to Kath, Lily hadn't considered the possibility that it would be gone. She had hoped the book would do the work of voicing the questions she wanted to ask. But without it, she was back where she had started. She was faced with a choice now. She could explain what the book had been about, or she could lie. Lily backed away into the corner between the science fiction rack and the rear wall of the store, and Kath followed her. They were quite alone now, and above them, the fluorescent light buzzed as if a mosquito were trapped inside the bulb. It was about two women. Lily's mouth felt so dry she might choke on the words. That book, Strange Season, 
it was about two women and they fell in love with each other. And then she asked the question that had taken root in her that was even now unfurling its leaves and demanding to be shown the sun. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Kath's eyes widened briefly. And then she looked down at the floor and over at the science fiction rack and back at Lily who felt her heart thudding like a drum, her blood rushing through her veins and turning her skin pink as she waited for Kath's response. An eternity seemed to pass. The heat of the fluorescent light on her head was like an artificial sun. The cash register at the front of the store rang like an alarm bell. Finally, Kath said one soft word, yes. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Melinda. Next, we have Kyle Lukoff for his book, Too Bright to See. Kyle has written a number of books, including a storytelling of ravens, when Aiden became a brother, and explosion at the poem factory, which sounds so cool, like a bunch of haiku and limericks get blown to smithereens, and now metaphors and similes are, okay, I digress. Kyle has worked in bookstores and libraries for over half his life, and he lives in New York City. National Book Award finalist Kyle Lukoff. Thanks, Kwame. Uh, the cat, I'm Kyle Lukoff. I'm reading from Too Bright to See. The cat behind me is named Tux. As we all sit around the table, I have a sudden glimpse of what we look like from the outside. Like I'm hovering above the table, looking down. Six girls with styled hair, some with bodies that are more uh, developed than others, in clothes from the right stores in the mall, talking and smiling like they all know some secret. And one person in grubby clothes, hair that isn't anything, sitting right in the middle like an ink splotch. It gives me that same creeping sensation I get at home when I accidentally glance into a mirror and the face looking back isn't mine. I suddenly wonder if this is what it's like being a ghost, looking at the world from above, apart from it, but wishing you were a part of it. Maybe ghosts haunt people because they want company. If this scene happened in a book, the older girls would be a little mean to me. Not outright bullying, but subtly making sure I know that I'm not one of them. Emily and Isla would join in because we were never really friends. And if this were in that same book, Moira would start acting like them, finally shedding her old friend like a peeling sunburn, and I would be sad and confused. But that doesn't happen, and I'm slowly pulled into the group. When I ask a question, they listen. One or two of them answer. Emily wants to know about the different sports clubs, and Isla asks if there's a school newspaper. I don't talk much at first because I haven't done anything this summer except be haunted by the ghost of my dead uncle slash maybe trans aunt. And that's not the first impression I want to make. But the girls work at drawing me into conversation. And soon we're talking about our favorite subjects in school, bad cafeteria food, and whether it's better to do your homework first thing on Friday or save it till Sunday before bed. Moira sits next to me, sometimes leaning her body into mine a little, and I press back into her. I can't be the easiest person to stay friends with, especially right now, but she's trying. And that means more than anything. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Next, we have Kekla Magoon for her book, Revolution in Our Time, The Black Panther Party's Promise to the People. That's a lot of peas. Kekla is the author of several novels for young people, including The Rock and the River, Fire in the Streets, and How It Went Down. She's the co-author with Ilyasha Shabazz of X, a novel. She's received the NAACP Image Award and a Coretta Scott King honor. She grew up in the state that makes more popcorn than any other state. That's right, Indiana. And now she lives in a state that was at one time its very own country for like 14 years, y'all. Vermont, where she teaches at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. National Book Award finalist, Kekla Magoon. Thank you, Kwame. <laughs> I'm Kekla, and I will be reading from Revolution in Our Time. 
This is a nonfiction book, and this is an excerpt from chapter one. <clears throat> Early in the morning on May 2nd, 1967, a group of 30 black people piled into cars in Oakland, California, and struck out on the highway headed for the state capitol in Sacramento. They were going to protest a bill called the Mulford Act, a piece of gun control legislation, which had been introduced specifically to prevent members of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense from carrying the weapons they used to protect citizens from police brutality. The powerful image of Black men with guns on the steps of the California legislature put the Panthers on the map. For most of white America, that image defined the Black Panther Party. But Black Americans watching from around the country recognized the deeper promise of social transformation that the Panthers offered. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense would not remain a small Oakland-based organization much longer. May 2nd, 1967 marked a significant turning point. The moment when the Black Panthers posture of armed self-defense became a matter of national awareness. This new militancy rolled across the American landscape like an earthquake, trembling the foundation of the Republic. On the surface, such an earthquake seems quite sudden. It catches people off guard. The ground begins to roll and it is all too easy to lose footing. Solid things, things designed to be immovable, tilt suddenly, casting all confidence askew. In moments of nervousness and fear, when the ground is shaking and it feels as if the world might come crashing down, sometimes people forget that earthquakes are in fact not sudden, nor do serious political movements arise in one fell swoop. Nothing happens overnight. The major turning points of history are seismic, born of eons of slightly shifting geologic plates. They do not emerge from nowhere. They are born of deep unrest. That's the end of the reading, but I will show you one image from the Panthers March on the Capitol, which is in chapter one. They just walked right in peacefully to protest for their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Kekla. Last, but definitely indefatigably can y'all spell that? Not least, we have Amber McBride for her book, Me, Moth. Amber teaches English literature at Northern Virginia Community College, also known as NOVA. She earned her bachelor's degree and master of fine arts degree in creative writing at Emerson College. Her work has been published in Plowshares, Provincetown Arts, Decomp, and more. She lives in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is a writer's haven, people and home to some pretty famous folks like Rita Dove, John Grisham, and of course, National Book Award finalist, Amber McBride. Hi, uh, my name is Amber McBride and I'll be reading from my book, Mima, which is a novel in verse. I'll be reading one poem. The poem is called Moths. Moths. Blossom in four stages because they are very good at poker and don't want to show all their cards at once. Egg, harden, caterpillar, grow, cocoon, rest, moth, live. This is how it goes. Egg is nothing special. We are all egg at one point. Think caterpillar, spotted and furry like a mustache snatched from a face. Cocoon is the miracle when the caterpillar literally melts sticky and soupy into a slop and reassembles itself into a moth. Imagine stepping out of the pot as Medusa. Imagine your DNA holding the secret to snake hair and stone men. Imagine being prepared to die just to fly a few weeks in the sky. It's like you're doing so good at living small almost mastered reigning in your ravenous joy. And then a boy with lava hair and a poet mouth swaggers in wanting your number. He smokes when he shouldn't and always taps, keeping time with his hands, which I imagine are softer than the mist that covers over the tops of mountains. That is what I imagine as I fall asleep the night before the last day of junior year. And for the first time in a long time, 
I'm not breaking in half in the back of a car. For the first time in a long time, I feel my ancestors and think of my gray bearded grandfather and the magic he taught me. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Amber. And thank you, Kecklin, Melinda, and Xingyin, and Kyle. Thank all of you for sharing a piece of your work with us. Rousing applause. <sighs> oh, yeah. So now let's get on to the, the call and response, the interactive, the Q&A part of this whole wonderful National Book Awards Team Press Conference. We got questions for our authors. Our first question is for Xing, and it comes from Arena at the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria in Queens. My name is Arena. The question I have for the author is why did she, uh, why did May make the legend of Antipo? Did she need her or something? What she got? Uh, yes. Um, so May lives in a very uh, sort of protected little uh, little logging camp where her father has tried to create a little peaceful world for her, um, you know, without racism, <laughs> without um, with with some privileges of her own. And she's coming into age at a time where she's realizing that that is just simply not true. And in the logging camp, she's listening to stories of Paul Bunyan who is, you know, an American, American legend, but Paul Bunyan doesn't look like her. The stories that she's hearing around her doesn't look like her. So she makes up Auntie Poe as an anchor for herself to have a maternal figure that, you know, that is Chinese, that looks like her and all the other workers she knows, um, and to, in a sense, make herself part of the American myth. Thank you for that question. It was wonderful. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so a number of students had questions for Amber all about, wait for it, the title, the title of her novel, Me Moth. The moth is in parentheses, Me Moth, Me Moth. One of those questions comes from Zanara at the Fannie Lou Hamer High School in Brooklyn. My name is Zanera, and my question for Amber McBride is, what made you want to write this, and how did her mother and father come up with the name Moth? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I, well, first of all, I wanted to write this book. I started writing it after my grandfather passed away to kind of remember him. Um, but the name Moth is from a Shakespeare play, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And her parents in the book were English professors and they just loved the name. Um, and I think the name represents this transformation. We always think of butterflies, but moths are absolutely extraordinary and they predate butterflies. And um, I just really loved the idea of it, of a moth and that being a name. Thank you, that's a really good question. Cool, we're learning so much. Moths predate butterflies. I had no idea. Okay. We also had a question for Kyle from Brooke at iPrep Academy in Miami. Kyle, in Too Bright to See, Bug often tries to imagine how other people, different characters, are feeling in order to empathize with them. Is this something that you remember from your own childhood? I think so. So that's funny. I've never been asked that before. Um, but yeah, I think as a kid, and I think still as an adult, I'm always very confused by other people in a lot of different ways, which I think is pretty normal, right? Like you never really know what's going on inside anyone else's head. And so I have always tried to figure out like, oh, why does this person seem angry? I don't know if I would be angry about that, but maybe they're angry because this, that, or the other. Or, you know, if that happened to me, I wouldn't really feel sad, but this person seems to be feeling sad. So maybe this experience is hitting them differently than it might hit me. And I think that that's 
one way that books are so magical is because you can really get inside a character's head and understand why they're having an emotional reaction to something, even if it's something that you've never experienced or something that you have experienced, but you didn't feel that same way about. And it helps you figure out really what is going on inside other people's heads so you can get along with them a little bit better. I'm still trying to figure that part out though. Thank you. Sweet, sweet. Okay, our next question is from Melinda, and it comes from Kaylee at the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria. Take it away. Hi, I'm Kaylee Panora, and my question for Melinda Lowe is, what is the author's inspiration for this book? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question, Kaylee. Um, inspiration is such a complicated thing. I think I think that a lot of people feel believe that inspiration is often from one one thing, right? But for me, inspiration is a whole bunch of things drawn together that kind of build off each other. So this book actually started as a short story called New Year, and it was published in an anthology called All Out, The No Longer Secret Stories of Queer Teens Throughout the Ages. So I thought it was just a short story, but then I um, talked about it with my agent and he said, this is really a novel. So I thought about it for a while longer and I realized that yes, there were so many questions that I had that came out of writing that short story that I could absolutely see a much longer book emerging from it. So that is where the novel began. And um, there are so many other bits of inspiration that pop up along the way that I get from doing research. Uh, since this is set in the 1950s, I, I'm so inspired by researching the history that has has gone past and by uncovering new things in history that um, we don't often know about today. Word, word, okay, okay. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, Kekla, we have a question from Julian in Brookline. Julian wants to know, what was your thought process in how you portrayed the Black Panthers? Specifically, Julian points out that readers probably aren't hearing about the Black Panther Party for the first time. So they come with ideas already, often from negative portrayals. So how did you think about correcting the record while presenting new information? Hi, Julian. Thank you. That is that very much sums up what I was trying to do in the book, which is to introduce the Black Panther Party to people who may never have heard of them, because a lot of people actually haven't heard of them. They don't have any impression of the Black Panthers, have never heard of them, don't know anything about them. Those who do know something about the Black Panthers usually only know a little tiny bit. They know one snapshot. They think Black men with guns, right? And for many of us, like me, you know, 10 years ago, I thought, oh, you know, guns, bad, scary. We don't even talk about that. It wasn't in the history books. And there was a reason why it wasn't in the history books. So I thought it was too scary to even think about. I thought it was not something to spend time on. But then when I was um, about 22, I was working for a grant writing program and I stumbled on an article about the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program for school children. And I thought, based on what I knew about the Black Panthers, breakfast, school children, what? That didn't make sense. It didn't compute. And so I started finding out more about the Black Panthers. And I learned that they were community organizers. I learned that they were activists. I learned that they ran candidates for office. They founded health clinics and, um, you know, they ad advocated for workers' rights and tenants' rights and all of these amazing things in Black communities around the country that I had had no idea that they had done. And for me, that was really eye-opening and startling. And it made me really excited because I was excited about that history that history, but it also made me really frustrated and angry that I hadn't been taught about that history when I was growing up. And so, you know, my thought process to your question, my thought process was, okay, if I grew up not knowing all of this, now I know it and I'm super excited and passionate about it. I think there might be lots of other people who would love to have this information. I think it's not fair that we don't trust young people with this, the truth of our history, the complexity of our history. The Panthers were complicated in their day. They're still complicated and controversial to talk about and think about. But for me, that's a reason to learn more about them, not a reason to hide them from our history books. And so I wanted to, to correct that record, like you said, and I wanted to introduce people who may never have heard of the Panthers to the Panthers and to the whole breadth of what they did, all of the nuance and all of the complexity. And I think it's a really exciting conversation 
conversation, especially right now when we have a whole new generation of teenagers and college students who are starting a movement of their own that isn't starting from scratch. They're building on the movements that have gone before. And so I hope that a book like this can help spark some conversations and bridge that divide between what happened 50 or 60 years ago and what's happening today. So, so that's, that's brings me to a question because I know a lot of students are aspiring to write, whether it be that personal essay they're trying to get an A on, or maybe they have loftier plans to become, you know, an accomplished novelist one day. So, so Kekla, do you feel it's your responsibility as a writer to, to teach, to inform, or are you just trying to entertain us? I think that the question of responsibility is really complicated. It's less of a responsibility that I feel as a writer or as an artist. I think that an, an artist's job is to put your passion into your work, to try to be entertaining, to try to be engaging, right? There's all these things that we do with our art for different purposes, but I feel like it's my responsibility as a human, as a person, as someone who cares about social justice, to use the skills that I have to advance the things I believe in and to help make the world a better place in the ways that I wanna see it be a better place. And for me, that means writing about the things I care about and trying to spark conversations that I care about. For other people who have different talents, that might be starting an organization or it might be going to a protest. It might be spearheading you know, a whole online movement, right? There's all these different ways that people participate, that people try to make change. But my way, because of the skills I have, my way is writing and teaching and sharing. So I don't know that it's my responsibility as a writer to teach per se, but I feel that I want to be part of something bigger than myself. I want to contribute. And what I have to offer is the stories that I tell and the ways that I can use words. So, okay, Melinda, are you trying to like, well, do you think there is discrimination against LGBTQ themes? In, in novels and, and are you trying to combat that with your books? Um, so when I grew up, there were basically no books with LGBTQ characters in them. I didn't grow up reading books with queer characters at all. It was not a thing that existed in, in my world at the time. I think there were a few books, um, but they were very hard to find. So when I started writing um, my first novel many years ago, which is, was called Ash, and it's a lesbian retelling of Cinderella, I did not set out to combat that necessarily. I simply set out to tell a story that I wanted to read. And I wanted to read a fairy tale in which a young lesbian falls in love and has a happily ever after. You know, I didn't think of it as any sort of act of resistance, but it was. You know, and I think that as a writer, as a writer, I as I've continued to write more books, what I have tried to do is follow my inner creative drive, my inner artistic vision. And what that is has been to put people like me in the books that I want to read. And so people have have seen that as an act of resistance in a way and an advocacy for LGBTQ people. Um, but it's also simply me using my voice, um, the, the, like Kekla said, you know, and I happen to be a queer Asian American woman. And there have been fewer of us who have been allowed to tell our stories in the ways that I am allowed to do it now. So I'm very happy to contribute to that at this time. So where do these stories come from, Kyle? Look, the next book you're going to be working on or the next book you're writing now. Where did it, how did it happen? Where did the inspiration come from? Were you walking down the street and you saw something? Tell us. So, I mean, one of you, Melinda, you were asked about inspiration earlier too, right? Um, I don't know, like, where does anyone get their inspiration from, right? Like, I'm on the subway and I'll see someone in a weird hat and I'm like, oh, that's a weird hat. I wonder if that hat is actually like sucking out that person's brain. Or I wonder if that hat used to belong to, I don't know, some famous person who sold it to a thrift store. And then you're like, wait, did the person at the store know where that hat came from? Do they know that that hat is sucking out the person's brains? And that just, you know, I could turn that into a book. I don't know. One of you could steal that idea from me. Or, you know, inspiration could come from just 
a thing that happened. Like I remember when my very first girlfriend broke up with me, uh, like she left me for her teammate, her like softball teammate. Cause I was, we were all lesbians back then. Um, and I was so sad and I started thinking like, oh, well, what if during a softball game, she gets hit in the head by a softball and then she has amnesia and she doesn't remember that she cheated on me. Like, what would I do? And like, that's a whole story by itself. Like Melinda, maybe you should write like a like lesbian softball amnesia story. Cause I don't know if I could tell that story anymore. Um, <laughs> Thank so you for all these ideas, Kyle, they're amazing. You're it's welcome. so hard to talk about inspiration. This is amazing. Well, so like, you know, we all notice things, right. And we all come up with stories around the things that we notice in our everyday life. And I think the real question might be like, not where do you get ideas from? Because we all have ideas, but how do you take that idea and turn it into a book that people get to hold in your hand? Um, and the answer to that is, you know, a lot of luck and for many of us, different privileges that we have, and also just sitting down and deciding to do it, like deciding that taking these characters that you made up and moving them around is what you'd rather be doing with your time than anything else. Um, once I quit my job, a big inspiration became paying rent. Uh, so that's been helpful for me recently. Um, but yeah, it's just comes from thinking weird thoughts in my head and then following those weird thoughts to their most illogical conclusion and then writing it down and hoping other people like it. All right, we're gonna come back to that idea, but quick question, when did you quit your job? If I can ask that question. Uh, so I had been an elementary school librarian and I decided to give notice at like the end of February of 2020 Wow. Mm, that was a choice to give up a job with health insurance. Uh, but it turned out pretty well for me. You took that leap. You said yes. Uh, Melinda, last job you had working for someone else. I was the managing editor of this website called After Ellen, which was kind of like an entertainment weekly for lesbian and bisexual women. Um, it was it was fun. I was like this was like in 2008. And I, yeah. I had to quit my job then because it was like a over full-time job. Like I was an entertainment reporter. I was also running the site. I was working like 70 hours a week and I had to write another book. So like, I couldn't do it unless I stopped that other job. Brilliant, so. 2008. Amber, when was it for you? Um, I mean, I'm a professor, so I guess now, uh, as far as like teaching. <laughs> Uh, right now, my students are turning in their papers late. Uh, I'm getting a lot of emails about that. But no, uh, I guess before that, I was a dog walker uh, before I was a professor. So in grad school and everything, I walked dogs and it was the best job of my life um, other than writing. Uh, but yeah, no, I love teaching. I teach at Nova and the University of Virginia and my students are hilarious constantly and constantly telling me that I need to get hip on new things like TikTok or make a TikTok, or they're convincing me I have to make a TikTok with them. So it's it's fun. Very cool. And Kekla, I know you're teaching at um, Vermont College of Fine Arts. What was your last job for that? Yeah, so I do teach part time right now, uh, but my last full time non writing related, well, non you know, author related job was uh, I was the development director for a small nonprofit in Harlem, New York. Sweet. sweet. So fundraising. OK, Xing Yin. Let me unmute myself. I've I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of odd jobs. Uh, I used to be a scenic designer for theater, which is actually a field that pays less than writing. Um, and then I think most recently I taught at a summer camp. That's so cool. We got dog walkers, <laughs> development directors, and scenic designers. This is so cool. So Xing Yin, uh, Kyle talked about making up stories and, and being inspired by any and everything. How much of your life are you bringing to those made up stories, if any? Oh, um, indulgently, I am bringing an indulgent amount of my own life to these stories. Uh, maybe not so much in specific details, um, but definitely in terms of feelings, in terms of uh, what the characters say and do. Um, in The Legend of Auntie Poe, uh, May is basically just me. Um, 
I mean, well, I mean, I literally have my hair in the same style that she does right now. And I did that. I did not do it for this. That's just what my hair looks like. And, um, you know, her relationship with her father is very similar to mine. Uh, her crush on her straight best friend is very similar to my life. Uh, you know, I, I plumb my own life indulgently for my stories. And I just said it, you know, 100 years back. So no one thinks that 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 I'm just writing a memoir. Ah, good to know. <laughs> By the, way, those, by the way, you should be a headphone model. Those headphones Thank look you. great on you. Uh, <laughs> Kekla, we all know reading is important in terms of becoming a writer. Like the way we learn how to write well is by reading other people. Absolutely. Immature writers imitate and mature writers steal. Nothing is new. So tell us, Kekla, um, last book you read. Uh, well, I've been reading everybody's books uh, here uh, since we were nominated. Yeah, um, yeah, we know. Aside from everybody yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the last book I read, um, apart from here, um, uh, I read Brandy Colbert's Blackbirds in the Sky. Ooh. Which is a non it? Yeah, it's absolutely awesome. It's a nonfiction book about the um, Tulsa race massacre of 1921, um, so 100 years ago. Um, and you should read the book. It's a really amazing nonfiction about this moment in, in, in history um, when there was this thriving Black Wall Street um, in in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and then um, a, 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 a race-related conflict um, escalated um, when a, a group of uh, white citizens tried to essentially to lynch a Black man who was accused of, of, of something, as happened frequently in those days. Um, and they, it resulted in um, the white community burning all of Black Wall Street, the whole Tulsa neighborhood. Um, and so it's an incredibly powerful story. Um, it underpins some uh, pop culture that we're seeing these days. But if you want the real story, check out Brandy's book. Very cool. The Watchmen. Yeah, Watchmen is basis is begins in, the, in that that moment. Yeah. Amber, last book you read. Um, this is going to sound like it's not true, but it's crossover by Kwame. Um, because I'm putting together for my next semester a young adult uh, verse class, and I was rereading it. Uh, so I've been reading a lot of just verse novels. I also um, read White Rose by Kip Wilson, uh, which is brilliant. So, yes. Sweet. I did not pay her for that endorsement. All right. So look, Amber, why do you write in verse? Or why did you choose to write Me Moth in verse? Oh goodness, that's a good question. Well, the truth is, um, I'm a debut novelist, so this was my, this is my first book that's been published, and I had written not in verse for a couple books, and nobody really wanted them. And then my agent knows that I have a background in poetry; that's what I have my master's degree in. And she was like, "You write adult poetry. You have a collection coming out. Why don't you try young adult?" And I was like, "Sure." Um, right around that time, my grandfather had passed away, and I was, you know. Poetry, you can't hide in it. You can really work through your grief and everything in poetry. And so I kind of sat down, outlined this book and went for it, wrote it in a month and a half, and it just kept editing it. But it was it was kind of going back to my, my roots of poetry and realizing that I didn't think I was a poet who could write a full novel in verse, because anybody who writes poetry, I'm sure a lot of you out there write poems. But then to write poems that connect into an entire story um, was the challenge. Uh, and I was reading a lot of other uh, books like Brown Girl Dreaming and things like that to try to get that feel. Uh, but yeah, it was just going back to my roots, working through grief and um, seeing if I could bring a very literary kind of aspect uh, to a novel in verse, uh, which I mean, there's sonnets in here and people won't know that. And I don't want people to know that. But the way that you can kind of work that in. So it was a challenge for me and also just to see if I could maybe figure it out. So yeah. Sweet, sweet. Xinyin, last book you read. Uh, Jordan Ifueko's, um her second book in the in the Redemptor series. Uh, it's, it's excellent. <laughs> Perfect, another high recommendation. Kyle, last book you read? Uh, yesterday, I finished a horror novel called, I think, The Hollow Place or The Hollow Places by T. Kingfisher. It scared 
the life out of me. It's so good. I love horror. Very cool. And Melinda, last book you read. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to cheat because the last book I read was Kyle's book. So I'm going to go back a few books and tell you about a book that I read that is out. It's, it's a couple years old. Uh, Your House Must Pay or Your House Will Pay by Steph Cha. It's an adult crime novel. It's about um, the lingering repercussions of the L.A. riots, uh, the relationships between this Korean American and black fam two black a black family and a Korean American family in L.A. and the things that happen between them and it is so complicated and so amazing. And the writing is electric and I just loved it. And I didn't know that much about the time period, even though I was alive then. And it was, it was so wonderful to read it. Melinda, what, what's a word, what's one of your favorite words? One of my favorite words. <sighs> now I don't know any words. Kwame, why do you ask this? When you ask what's this the, question, I can't think of any words. What's the throughout. word you love to hear? A word you love to hear? Um, euphoria. Euphoria. Kekla, what's a sound you love? Oh, I love the sound of rain and thunderstorms outside, especially at night when I sleep. Ah, ah. Are you a morning or night writer, Xinyin? Uh, I write exactly in the mid-afternoon. I'm only functional between the hours of 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Brilliant. Last piece of really good advice you got, Kyle. Oh, oh, I can't say that in public. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind, I can't say in public. Um, oh, get a tetanus shot. <laughs> I cut myself really badly on something and I don't know what. So for the last few days, I've been terrified that I have locked jaw. I probably don't. I probably don't have locked jaw. Um, and I should probably get a tetanus booster, but I haven't yet. I'm probably Amber, fine. Amber, when it's all said and done and you've written all your wonderful novels and some kid is interviewed about your work, what do you want them to be able to say about your work? Wow, that's not an easy question. Uh, what I want them to be able to say that it was each book was different and inspected something different that I constantly tried to try new things all the time and challenge myself. I hope, I hope that each book feels different. I hope that's what they say at least. And that's what we're trying to do at the national book award. We're trying to make sure it all, it's all different. It's all unique. It's all distinct. It all means something. These are the words of wisdom we want to leave you with. We want to tell you that, these wonderful authors are going to be at the National Book Awards on Wednesday, November 17th at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern. A link will be in the chat. We want to remind you that books are amusement parks, teachers, and students got to be able to choose the rides. We want to remind you in the words of Lee Bennett Hopkins, the famous, acclaimed, dynamic poet, good books, good times, good stories, good rhymes, good beginnings, good ends, good people, good friends, good fiction, good facts, good adventures, good acts, good stories, good rhymes, good books, good times. If y'all had a good time today, show some love, read these books, support these authors. We all love awards, but the real award is when you read our books. National Book Awards would like to thank you all for tuning in. Thank our particip participants. I can't even get the word out. I'm so excited. Kyle, Xinyin, Kekla, Amber, and Melinda, nothing but love. And that, my friends, is a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>